going to start this in a minute. Yeah. The live thing, so you can go on YouTube or Facebook and look on the YouTube link. Uh -huh. And you can see if I have sound. Okay. Can't hurt. All right. Hi again, everyone. We want to welcome you back to our free public program this evening up here at UACNJ. Well, I'm not. She can't even hold them up to her eyes yet. Duh. So far, the sky to our west has a couple clear spots for tonight's viewing. Let's cross our fingers and hope that holds out. And guys, as always, it's my pleasure to be here with you live from beautiful Jenny Jump State Forest at UACNJ. We have our team over here, Sean and Sebastian, checking our guests in with reservations for this evening. And as you guys know, to attend our public program up here at UACNJ, we ask that you do make a reservation for this evening or any of our future programs in our 2021 season. Well, as astronomers, we do not like clouds. But that is a pretty sky. As I was mentioning a little while ago, reservations are still required while you're up here at UACNJ. In addition to that, face coverings are mandatory while you are up here on property. If you feel while you're up here at UACNJ you would like to wear a face covering, we encourage it. If you're up here at UACNJ and you feel you don't want to wear your face covering and you're comfortable, that's quite all right as well. Tonight's program, a fantastic talk given by one of our good friends, Carl, and he's going to be talking to you about time travel. This is our observatory puppy, Hubble. Hubble, say hi to your live followers here. If anybody wants to come on up and play Frisbee, I know you would make one puppy very happy. And folks, if you do decide to come up to UACNJ, and you do decide to bring your puppy, we implore you to please keep your dog leashed at all times. We also ask that you pick up after your puppy, after the puppy does his business. Guests are starting to arrive. Here's our friend Karen. Hello Karen. Standing underneath this gorgeous sky. How about that sky, guys? Let's see what we have over on the other side here of the Jenny Jump Rock. So for those of you who haven't been up here in person, this is our view from the rock. Come on up, guys. Enjoy. So while you're up here at UACNJ, make sure you stop by and check out that spectacular view. 
and this time of year UACNJ offers some beautiful sunset skies. So just in case you're sitting over in the presentation area right now and you want to know what that sunset looks like. Hey Carl, check out that screen. Let's take a walk over speaking of Carl. Carl's a good friend of mine. Great friend of UACNJ. Carl's been a volunteer up here for many, many years. As much as we don't like clouds, isn't that beautiful? All right. So we've got a great team here tonight, guys, making sure we get everybody into the observatory safely. Sean and Sebastian over here on top of the parking situation, keeping all our visitors safe tonight up here at UACNJ under that beautiful sky. More. Turn it harder. Why this way? I'm assuming you got a camera. I do. Keep on coming. Hopefully those clouds will stay away. This way. Turn, turn, turn. So we're going to do our best. Not that one. Guys, while I have you here, I would like to introduce you. As he walks right behind me over there, there goes Paul. Paul's our new president. He's been here for two years up at UACNJ. So Paul is the man behind the scenes keeping UACNJ functioning, which is actually fantastic as a former board member and former president up here. It makes me very happy to have somebody who is extremely competent and fantastic at what he does. Okay. It's always nice to see people arriving for our program this evening. And just in case you don't know by now, we do ask that you bring your own blanket or chair to attend our public program. All of our programs start promptly at 8 p.m. And just in case you can't make it up here, I hope you know by now you can find all of our public programs streaming live on YouTube. Guys, we also post that link streaming live on Facebook as well. Not only will you see today's program streaming live, but you're able to go back and see our previous programs. So let's say you missed last week's talk or you missed the week before. Maybe you missed Lonnie's talk and you don't know what's up in the August sky. That's okay. Because we definitely want you to come up here and attend our public programs. And we always want you to watch them online if you can't do that. But if you missed it, go back and find it. Check it out. All our programs up here at UACNJ are always available for you online. Oh, here they come, guys. Thank you for making those reservations this evening. And guys, we do ask that if you have a reservation for UACNJ, and for some reason you are unable to attend our program in person, to please cancel that reservation so that other people can take your spot.
We've got the A team on tonight, handling all our parking needs, getting everybody there safely. And in about five minutes, guys, our program will start. So what I'm going to do for the next four minutes, we're going to do one quick walk through here. I'm going to head over, introduce you to Carl, and try not to get run over because I wasn't paying attention. My fault. I was on my phone. Always have to watch where we're walking when we do these live videos. You never know who's going to be driving where. Okay, so I'd love to show you a nice clear sky tonight, everyone. But right now, our clear sky is getting smaller and smaller. But that's okay. We're here. And if you can't join us live up here in person, you know how to find us online on YouTube under UACNJ. This way, uh, that'd be great. So, right next. All right. So, real quick. Well, uh, I know a lot of you guys know Ken Taylor. He's in the first hut on the left. Right now, while nobody's in here, before I head over to our public program for tonight. I'm just going to give you a quick look at the telescope. Got a lovely Celestron here. And see, guys, it's not about the size of the telescope. So that's something you can always keep in mind. Also, one of our public programs is I bought a telescope. Now what do I do? So if you aren't able to join us for that public program, you're definitely going to be able to find that program in our archive on YouTube. All right, guys, so what I have right now, 757. That means in three minutes, countdown now, time travel with Carl from UACNJ. One of my favorite talks. Okay. We're back over here now. Seven fifty eight. Perfect timing. I hear the cicadas have shown up for tonight's talk. Fantastic. I have Carl over. It's all about time travel. If you've never traveled through time, I highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Carl's going to give you some more information about it shortly. And before that, we have our observatory chairman, Chris Kelly, in the picture real quick. Looks like he's about to walk away. There we go. Chris is the man behind the scenes up here in charge of our observatory, all of our equipment and everything like that. So what I'm going to do now, turn this camera, put my mask up, I'm going to come over. Introduce you first one is going to be tonight, Steve. Hi, Steve. I've known Carl for quite some time up here at UACNJ. Carl's going to tell you all about time travel tonight. Tim is going to give you the information you need to know about Two of my going on. Hello. Hello. So, guys, stay safe. Thank you to everybody behind me for making that reservation. And Tim, uh, your show. thank you, Matt. All right. So, at, as uh, 
Matt has been doing our intro. Welcome to United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey. Um, just to let you know, we are actually live streaming this on our YouTube channel. So if you ever can't get a reservation or you're on vacation looking for something to do on a Saturday night, you can always hit up our YouTube stream and check out uh, what we have streaming there. So since we are live streaming, I am actually online moderating chat through my phone. Um, a couple things while we get the last couple people kind of situated here since we are presenting live on location. Wow, that, yes, yes. This is uh, our lecture area since uh, COVID hit and uh, our our lecture hall is a little too uh, enclosed to accommodate many people and allow a little bit of spreading out. So a couple things before we get started. Uh, thank you for joining us. We are a nonprofit uh, program. We do, uh, Hold on. I just, someone just said, hey, we can't really hear you with the mask. So can we hear me better now? Yeah. Ah, okay. So first thing first, let's check out our website, uacnj.org. That is where you can get an entire list of all our programs uh, this year, where you can check to see what's coming up, what we've already done. Like I said, we do stream these to YouTube, so you can uh, also see all our past broadcasts since COVID started and be able to check them out there. Second of all, for our live audience here, if you need the restroom, we have the porta potty located to my right, your left. Uh, also, at the end of the program, I will be manning our little gift shop. We have over to my left or your right. We are a nonprofit, like I said. So any donations, any any uh, sales through that go to help keeping our lights on and help us keep offering the free public programs and various outreach programs. So oh, it looks like we maybe have a couple stragglers coming in from the rock. All right. So. With that, uh, when we go to leave today, uh, please use your headlights. We don't like getting run over by cars. I'm sure you can agree with that sentiment that we want to avoid getting run over by cars. So as much as we like our dark vision, we like less pain in our lives. So let's avoid that. And with that, our presentation tonight is time travel with our very own Carl. Carl has a doctor doctorate in science education and taught earth science at Carteret High School and astronomy at the Union County College, Keene University, and Centenary Co University. He has worked on a project at the Space Telescope Science Institute at John Hopkins University to examine an alleged discordant redshift between the galaxy NGC 4319 and the quasar MRK-205 with the Hubble Space Telescope. Carl is a past president of Amateur Astronomers Incorporated and, has, and United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey and is currently serves as president of the New Jersey chapter of the National Space Society. He is a member of Amateur Astronomers Incorporated and Northwest Jersey Amateur Astronomers many of which those are actually member clubs of United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey. He is a past chair of the planning committee here at UACNJ, at, where we, that plans for special programs for scout schools and other groups, as well as our Saturday programs. And Carl also hosts a science show on WNTI radio at Centen Centenary University in Hackettstown. And with that, let's explore time travel with Carl. Welcome, everybody. Oh, good to see you all here, hiding, hiding under that uh, covering. But in the meantime, let's find out what's happening with uh, time travel. And uh, here's a, a painting by some artists. Anyone recognize who may have made this painting? No, Dolly, somebody said it, yes. Looks like that clock is melting, and I guess you can interpret this. Okay, we'll try now. Is it working? One? Is it working? 
Oh, okay, maybe that's why. Anybody not hear me? No? Okay. Well, you can, <laughs> uh, there we are. You can interpret this any way you want, obviously, but uh, that's not the point. We're talking about uh, time travel, and uh, right now, I suppose you can say we're all traveling through time. Every second that goes by, we're going into the future. So that's a sneaky way of saying we're time traveling. But I know that when people say time travel, what they usually mean is uh, somehow we're able to project ourselves back in time or to the future, one way or the other. And uh, there's some ideas about it, but overall, right now, as you well know, it's uh, not that possible. We need a lot of energy, and that involves a kind of advance in technology, which we don't have presently, but we're moving to it. We're moving toward it. And I'll mention some things here that lead us into the idea of uh, uh, probably developing some kind of a device that we can call a time machine. So this is the idea. Right now, can't travel in time, but developing means by way we can. And again, we have to solve the idea of energy. Energy is important. So here we go with the idea of uh, time travel. Is it possible? Well, not right now, but the probability is there. If we consult these people, we might find out how to do it. But we have to get a DeLorean first, if you saw the movie. Back to the Future. Well, what is time? Well, we all know what time is. I mean, we can know what it is intuitively. We can talk about it. But there's always some kind of definition given in dictionaries and things of that nature. So it's a spatial continuum of events in an irreversible kind of succession from the past to the present to the future. Wow. In other words, we're moving through a succession of events that's occurring. And one thing that's interesting is that uh, our notion of time, our perception of it, depends upon how our brain works. And so this is another variable thrown into the mix that affects our perception of time and time travel as well. But I won't be covering that at this point. I'll be covering the information about what are the possibilities of traveling through time. Carl? Yes. So. Move your mic. Sorry. Hello? Hello? Okay. This mic works. And you're going to use that mic. Now can you hear me? Okay, I guess you can. Oh, all right. What's the nature of time travel? What do we mean by saying time travel? Well, it's the idea of moving uh, in time between one point and another. Just like, for example, uh, moving in space from one point to another. But something interesting about time, too, is that it's uh, only unidirectional, it seems, moving in one direction only. Whereas if you're talking about space, we're talking about the idea of moving through three dimensions. Now, including time, we're moving through the fourth dimension. But time itself seems to only point in one direction. Now, that may not be the case, but uh, that's how we perceive it at the present time. And the idea of uh, time, going back in time, you can apply this when we come here to Jenny Jump to look through the telescopes at the sky at night. We're looking at stars, and the stars are producing light that has to travel through space. And it takes a while before light travels to us, traveling at the rate of, what, 186,000 miles per second? So it takes a while to get here from the sun. Light takes about eight minutes. Then the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, takes about 4.2 minutes to get here. From something like a galaxy, the spiral galaxy closest to us, the Andromeda Galaxy, it takes, what, 2.4 million. I should, I should have said light years, I'm sorry, from... Uh, Proxima Centauri it takes about 2.4 light years. From something like the Andromeda Galaxy, though, it takes about 
well, 2.4 million years. So it takes a while before light gets to us. That means that as you look up at the sky, we're looking up at the past. So the sky at night looking at the stars is like a time machine, if you think of it that way. We're seeing old starlight just reaching us. That's an amazing kind of proposition when you think about it. So next time you look up at the stars, think of it that way. Think of looking up at the past, looking at light that has left those objects many years ago. Maybe some don't exist at the present time. But what is the present time? Ah, another story. We don't know that too well either. Well, there are many stories about time travel that have been written way back in the past. As a matter of fact, it's said that some parts of some of the religious texts, like the Talmud and some of the Indian texts in Sanskrit, had written information about time travel to a certain extent. But we're looking at those recently which have been published. And for example, the first one, it sought to have been published, you can see is what, in 1819 over here, Rip Van Winkle. Sometimes I'm Rip Van Winkle, I think, when I wake up late in the morning, being a late person at night, but I don't sleep that long. In any case, I'm not Rip Van Winkle. Also, the idea of uh, this uh, publication you can see here in uh, 1881 is about the idea of a clock moving backward in time. So we've had a lot of different kinds of books written about that. And, of course, the one uh, involving the Time Machine by H.G. Wells. And uh, here's H.G. Wells, you can see him. And uh, the idea being that uh, here's an image taken from the movie itself, and that looks like some kind of a wild machine that he came up with to go back in time. But going back in time may have a problem, too, may, may uh, somehow create problems for you. And this is a problem H.G. Wells had. His wife said, uh, Dear, I, uh, I, use your, I use your thing uh, and went back 30 years. And guess what I found out? And not that I went back 30 years. I went into the future 30 years. And guess what I found out? You still didn't put up the kitchen, the kitchen racks in it in the kitchen, the shelves. Anyway, this may have a problem if you create a time machine and uh, you don't do the things you're supposed to do. Now, idea of the time machine being written in uh, different kinds of publications. Uh, here is a, a publication that uh, shows a story written by Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. And uh, this was written quite some time ago, as you can see here. It was made into a movie in the 60s, starring in the movie, if you may have seen this, Bing Crosby and Rhonda Fleming. So it's made into a movie as well. And uh, here's the idea of Schwarzenegger coming to us from the future as a robot. And uh, as a result, he comes back to murder someone who will grow up to be a kind of person in charge as a leader, leading a revolt against the robots that have taken over humans in the future. And that's his purpose coming back. And we have uh, the idea of going back to the future, the trilogy. Now, a telephone booth here, what does that indicate? Well, there's been a story about some superhero who needs to tell who needed in the past anyway a telephone booth to change Clark Kent and of course he changed in that telephone booth to Superman and in this case here I don't know how he did it nowadays though because we have no more telephone booths as you notice but what he did here is he traveled at quite a fast speed around the earth in the opposite direction to the earth's orbit or the earth's uh, a spinning rotation and as a result, he caused the Earth to stop and begin spinning, the, rotating the other way. And when he did that, it was claimed that he made time go backwards. And I don't know if that's the case, but that's how it was perceived in that movie. Now, the real idea involves theories of time travel, starting with Einstein and his theories of special and general relativity. Now, special relativity, think of S in special and S in speed. 
It deals with the speed of light, which he says cannot be passed, cannot be surpassed, because of uh, things like, if anything, a mass a closer as approaches the speed of light, it increases in mass. The energy is being converted into mass. And that's shown in his equation, E equals mc squared. Energy equals matter, and matter equals energy. So as a result, as something approaches the speed of light, it increases in mass to the point where it can no longer reach the speed of light and surpass it. But there are sneaky ways of getting around that, possibly. And we don't have to have the object itself moving at the speed of light. But whatever kind of medium it's placed in might do that, which is allowable in terms of Einstein's equations. Now, one of the uh, situations mentioned that might be a possibility is the notion that if there are twin astronauts and one of them goes into space, he's going maybe well, close to the speed of light. He's accelerating. And when you accelerate at the speed of light, time slows up. It dilates. Time dilation takes place, approaching the speed of light. And when time slows up, you, your age slows as well. And so when this astronaut returns back to Earth again after accelerating to space and returning, he's younger than his brother. So this is called the twin paradox. How this happens determines, is determined by the notion of time slowing down when it approaches the speed of light. That's in this special theory of relativity predicted by Einstein. Now, there's also the idea that besides age being slowed down, we do have the idea of, uh, I guess, not being able to travel that fast because we will be, be unfortunately gaining weight and not being able to do it. But also the idea is that uh, if uh, you begin to, oh, let me say one thing about the idea of the speed of light. Uh, if you're on a moving object, like a train, for example, your time slows down because you're accelerating. If you sit like we are right now or stand still, your time relative, you have to compare it, relative to a person that's moving, winds up being faster than the person moving. So the person moving, since his time is slowing down, his age is slowing down. He winds up being younger than you are. Now these are hard things to wrap the mind around when you think about it, but these things have been predicted by Einstein and certainly they're being proven to be true. And also, if you're, for example, let me go back. If you're also on top of a building, well, that's uh, uh, the next one coming up in terms of gravity. So we have to show gravity first. Let me show that. Now, the general theory of relativity deals with gravity. G for general, G for gravity. That's how you remember it. Don't forget the special S for speed of light and G for the idea of gravity. And what Einstein says is that gravity is not a force, but it's a warping, a bending of the fabric of space-time. Something has to bend it. And so something like, for example, a large object like a star or even a planet, and we can think of it in terms of an, an analogous bowling ball on uh, a sheet of rubber or a trampoline will bend the trampoline downward. And if you shoot a marble around that bowling ball that's making this kind of uh, a bending of the trampoline, if you shoot a marble around it, it begins to move towards the bowling ball. It looks like gravity is pulling it in, but it's not. It's the warping of that trampoline that's causing the marble to move to the bowling ball. And so the same idea can be applied to any kind of object in space, large object like, as I mentioned, a star or the planets. And uh, it, it's also caused by smaller objects, but uh, the effect is not that noticeable, obviously. So these, this is the definition of gravity by Einstein saying it's not a force, but the bending 
of space-time, the warping of it, causing that effect. And the general theory of relativity can be applied, for example, uh, to the idea of time again. Time slows up in the presence of gravity. So if the gravity is greater, the time slows up. And that's interesting as well, because if I were holding, and um, as time slows up, of course, uh, as you as you're closer to the center of gravity, and that time slows up, it means that a person at a lower level, say for example, at the bottom of a building, say a skyscraper, would have time going slower, would age more slower than a person who's in the upper part of the building, at the top of the skyscraper. So uh, the gravity is more at the bottom of the building. And therefore, it's slowing down the time of the person at the bottom of the building. And therefore, he's aging more slowly than the person at the top. The same thing is true in any kind of relative respect to be talking about someone at the top of a mountain or a person below the mountain. So uh, determine what altitude you're living at. And, and find out whether you're aging more slowly or faster than someone living at a different altitude, closer to the center of gravity at the center of the Earth. So this is an effect that's caused by the idea of gravity and general relativity. Now, this thing takes place, it, interestingly enough, and has proven to take place in our own GPS system of orbiting satellite. And the idea being that the orbiting satellite has a clock on it, and it does an atomic clock, the clock on that orbiting satellite is going faster than a relative clock on the surface of the Earth. And that's because the clock on the Earth is closer to the center of gravity. Its time is going at a slower rate. And so as a result, the GPS in the satellite, the clock in the GPS, has to be adjusted to that change in time. Otherwise, we gain about well, we gain about 38 microseconds every day, which can affect, in maybe a day or two, determination of our location on the GPS. So we have to be aware of that. And this is proof that gravity is affecting the two clocks differently, depending upon where they're located relative to the center of gravity. This is proof of Einstein's theory of general relativity definite proof of it. And here's the idea of the building again. If you're up on top of a building, the notion being that uh, you're further away from the center of gravity, and so therefore your time is going faster than someone who's down below in the basement or something of that nature. Now, what about going to the future? Well, going to the future uh, is easier than going to the past. This problem is with the past because you start to mess up history and you start to mess up the causal relationships that take place, one, one event causing another one in a chain reaction. And when you do that, it doesn't work out in terms of the physics and the laws of causality and uh, in terms of logic. So going to the past is hard. You have to do something else to go to the past if you're gonna try at all doing that. Going to the future is relatively easy. Uh, we can move to the future right, we're moving to the future right now, as I mentioned before, and also you can move to the future in terms of some kind of time travel, but one of the problems is that if you make a time machine now, uh, only a person in the future can move back to the time machine when it's made to the past. We, making the time machine now, can't move back to the past because there's no time machine there to move back to, unless we do something else. But these are one of the problems, or some of the problems, in moving to the future versus moving to the past. So the idea of uh, uh, moving backward in time, moving to the past, is harder because of what I just mentioned in terms of um, messing up history. You don't want to do that because you'll wind up influencing whatever has taken place and uh, it doesn't go in line with causal relationship, what event causes another. 
in a chain reaction as to what is happening today. Now, the idea is that there are theories of time travel. Here's several of them here. And uh, of course, there's probably more than this, but these are uh, one of those, or some of them, that are the most important kinds of theories. Using electricity or magnetic fields, one. Another would be the idea of Einstein's theory of special relativity and general relativity. And the idea of wormholes and uh, black holes before the wormholes. And the notion of what's called a rotating cylinder, Kepler cylinder. And we'll get into all these in a moment. The notion of, uh, uh, we'll say, um, strings, cosmic strings in space. And the idea of a rotating laser is an interesting kind of proposition as well. So these are ways, possibly, that we can uh, move through time and create various kinds of time machines. One way is to get a DeLorean, but that's not going to happen. I realize that. And also, to work in that DeLorean, a flux capacitor, which will enable us to move through time as a result of that. Now, one of the first people I came up, at least giving credit, not as much credit as he should be given, as a matter of fact, he's still a mystery. And what he's done is still a mystery. Tesla, Nikolai Tesla. And, uh, of course, the car is named after him, but he was a live person. He did really exist. And he worked with electricity and magnetism, magnetic fields. And he said you could use those to pair some kind of a, uh, a strip of space, space-time, to create a doorway through which to enter space and time. He claims he was able to do that. I tried to find out information about that, but I wasn't able. Uh, there is nothing remaining, pretty much, of his work that he had done and his papers. And it's, uh, as a result, it's hard to find out that information about what he has done. But that was his claim, that he was able to move back in time. Now, as far as a black hole is concerned, we could talk about black holes that don't rotate and those that do. Well, the ones that do enable us, maybe, to travel through it to a different point in time or a different universe, as a matter of fact. The rotating one, as it rotates, you can see in the picture in the lower right, bulges. Anything rotating usually bulges and creates what's known as an ergosphere through which a passing astronaut or whoever travels through it can move through and bypass the middle of the black hole, the singularity, where he would be ripped to shreds, first being stretched out like a noodle, spaghettified, and then, of course, being killed by going through that singularity. But if he goes through the ergosphere, it's believed that he might escape that. And maybe, somehow, if there's a connection between one black hole and another, there might be a passageway. This is the idea of the black hole, a diagram on the upper left over here showing how it might look. There's an event horizon over which anything that passes cannot escape, even light can't pass out through that black hole. Hey, and by the way, I meant to put a picture in here, but I didn't, uh, of a recently taken image of a black hole, actually. And if you haven't seen that, check it out on the internet. Go online and look for images of the black hole. So it was taken recently, as a matter of fact, with the, within the past uh, few months. So it's, it's interesting to see how it looks. But anyway, we do have black holes existing. It's not a hypothetical, theoretical kind of object. And here's an artist's conception on the right of how a black hole might be created. You have to have some kind of a massive object, like a star, collapsing. And when it collapses, it condenses, compresses space around it to uh, some kind of unimaginary density. And as a result, anything passes in, as I mentioned, gets trapped inside and can't escape. And there's all ideas about the black hole, too. What happens around the event horizon and things of that nature? What happens to information that goes in? Does it disappear? Does it come out somewhere? No one knows about that either. And so there's all kinds of hypothetical ideas about how that takes place as well. 
Well, something else called a Tipler cylinder, which is made of some kind of uh, material structure. But now they realize it's got to be really a long kind of structure and is almost um, impossible to come up with. So this problems with the Tipler cylinder, which uses the idea that it rotates around its long axis. And as it rotates, it causes what's known as frame dragging. And I'll get that in a moment. Frame dragging. And that's what enables Tipler, here he is, to think about the idea of having his device, the rotating cylinder, to twist space, to warp it around, to twist it, to produce a curved timeline. And when you do that, it's believed you can go back to the past. So it's a device that is possible, as far as he's concerned anyway, to move back to the past only if you can come up with something that enables you not to make it that large, that long, which is necessary, it seems. And don't forget, anything of that nature that is involved in time travel requires a lot of energy or a lot of mass. And that's our problem right now. There's not the technology to provide that kind of uh, thing to take place. Now, here's the idea of frame dragging I mentioned. And what that is, is that any kind of a large object, object like stars, as they rotate, will twist space around it, dragging space as if you had something like, uh, again, maybe a basketball or something of that nature, twisting uh, a material it's set on. As it twists the material, it, the material backs up on itself. And it's believed by frame dragging this way in space-time, that large object rotates so it can twist space-time back on itself, and you can use it to go back in time, possibly. And that's the idea of that. Now, uh, where does a black hole go to? Well, the idea of having a connection between black holes came up with the idea of Einstein and Rosen. And they had the idea that if there were two black holes, they could possibly affect space in the vicinity so there would be a passageway created between them as they affected space-time between them themselves. And the passageway would be the wormhole. It was originally called the Einstein-Rosen Bridge. And theoretically, it's possible based on the equations of both of them as they worked it out mathematically. So it seems possible that a wormhole can exist. Oh, and by the way, I was able to uh, talk to one of the uh, theoretical physicists over at the University of Buffalo. And the uh, uh, reason why I contacted him is because I wanted to find out how he intended to look for and test for the presence of a wormhole in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. So there's now a belief that there might be a wormhole of this nature located right in the middle of our Milky Way galaxy. That's something quite interesting as well. So he's, he's setting up a test to see if that's possible. That's what a wormhole is then, a passageway, a connection between black holes, or sometimes they call one end the black hole, one end the white hole, um, in order to indicate that there's two separate structures. And this will lead you, if you could pass through it somehow or other, into a different part of the universe, possibly, at a different time, or to a different universe. So it seems wormholes are in our future. So watch how you eat those apples. Wormhole, apple. OK, in any case, the idea of some kind uh, notion of creating a wormhole, which I just mentioned. I went through the idea of how we create it in terms of getting two black holes together and forming it that way. And here's a notion of how it can be created by a scientist, Kip Thorne. He's famous for that, coming up with the notion of how to create the black hole. And he's talking about the warping of space-time, like having a piece of paper, upper left image over here, and bedding the paper, poking a hole through the upper end and through the lower end. And that those two holes can be joined by some kind of passageway. 
So you can see by bending the paper, you're shortening the space between the two black holes, the two holes. And so the connection is made over a shorter space of distance and space of time. You can travel through that area, through that wormhole, by bending that space-time. That was his notion. Kip Thorne, wormhole. Important if you want to travel at all. Now, some of the problems with the wormhole is that it requires a lot of energy. It requires a kind of uh, energy called negative energy, which uh, is also connected to negative mass and anti-gravity. Uh, and the idea that uh, it only works at low temperatures, but now something else is being, uh, has been discovered. I'll talk about that a little more as we go on. In the meantime, we need to solve the problems of that energy necessary with what's known as exotic matter, as I mentioned, negative mass, same thing, negative energy, and the idea uh, of, uh, what's known as the Bose-Einstein condensate, BEC, Bose-Einstein condensate. <laughs> There's Einstein again. He gets into everything. Bose-Einstein condensate. And this is being declared as the fifth state of matter. Fifth state of matter. And uh, it has been, I'll mention this later on, but I'll mention it now anyway. It has been created. NASA has come up with the idea, and you can check this out on the internet. NASA has created this fifth state of matter on board the space station in this special kind of refrigerator that they had installed that can lower the temperature close to absolute zero because they're in space. Expose it to space, have the temperature lowered, and you get close to absolute zero. So initially they thought that that was what was required, and as a result, that's what NASA did. And they did create the BEC, the Bose-Einstein condensate. That's a step forward in being able to hold open the wormhole, which has a tendency to collapse because of gravity. So we're moving forward step by step. And this is an important step forward in talking about and increasing our probability of time traveling in the future. Another kind of effect is the Casimir effect that might also hold open the wormhole, and it creates energy in a vacuum by shooting electromagnetic energy through it. The longer waves are kept out of these two close plates. Bring the plates as closely together as possible. The long waves can't enter the in between the plates, but the short waves can. And as a result, it builds up energy in the interiors. You're creating energy in a vacuum by using electromagnetic energy with a Casimir effect. And if you can do this in large amounts of energy, which now is hard to do, obviously, you can use this as well as the condensate, the Bose-Einstein, con the BEC, the negative mass idea to keep open the wormhole. So we're moving forward, step by step, little by little, ideas are coming up in terms of theories and uh, uh, proving certain theories correct. Step by step, we're moving in that direction. Now, the idea of exotic matter, I mentioned before, you need exotic matter to keep the wormhole open. And I mentioned exotic matter is negative mass. It's all mentioned here in terms of that. And uh, that sounds almost like uh, something impossible. How could you have negative mass, but again, I, as I mentioned, it was created. Something interesting, too, about this. Recently, also, you can check this out on the internet, too. Uh, mm. Although it was believed that exotic matter could only be created at temperatures close to absolute zero, someone in a recent experiment claims that they were able to produce this exotic matter at room temperature. Wow. That's an important kind of step forward, if the case is true. There uh, might be some kind of questions about that, but that was the claim of the experimenters that worked on it. So that's quite interesting as well. When you need that, a lot of energy, and so forth. Now here's the uh, idea of exotic matter, the fifth state of matter. And I mentioned it was created already by NASA, and in the laboratory, if that can be called negative matter. Imagine anti-gravity 
It has all kinds of implications. All kinds of implications in terms of what it can do. Now, why we don't have time presently? Well, as I mentioned before, it's believed to have time presently. You have to move back to the time machine if that's the necessary case. That may not be the case, but that's how it's thought of now. And it hasn't been a time machine made yet. That's working. So we can't go back to a time machine. But somebody in the future might come back to a time machine created now. That's one of the problems. You can't return back now. The energy necessary? We don't have that much energy now. But uh, as uh, technology goes on, we will have energy. But one thing that supports all this is the idea that in Einstein's equations, the solutions of the equations indicate that all these things are possible. That's the important aspect of it, showing that it is possible. All we need right now, though, is the correct engineering and uh, also technical advancement that's necessary. But this is why we don't have it presently. Yeah? Okay. So oh you can't hear oh, now you can on and off um it's with the stream side oh okay um so we're just gonna take a quick minute okay uh, brief break brief break <laughs> hold your time don't travel anywhere yet please <laughs> yeah so uh normally I wouldn't interrupt the uh, program uh but I did have a couple people in in the online chat go hey uh connectivity issues so we are trying to get those back up um i can talk to him yeah so we're he's just gonna do some uh, filler I'm babbling, okay? you can hear me? I'll, I'll, I'll say a few babbling words okay yeah the idea being uh that uh, as i mentioned before time travel possibility those equations show it uh, there's that possibility so we're doing that and uh, of course uh, when you talk about time travel, I know most people think about moving through time bodily, physically. And you can think about that two different ways, if you want to. The idea being that you have to be in a vehicle, time machine, to move back in time. Well, maybe that's not the case. Maybe we can move back in time as not a participant, but as a viewer of the history. Maybe that might be a way of doing it. That way we won't be messing up history in any kind of causal relationships, violating any kind of physical laws, things of that nature. So if some kind of time device can be, be uh, <laughs> manufactured or, or created, that takes us not back to the future physically, but as a viewer not as a participant. That way we're not influencing what has gone on in past history. Well, then maybe we'd like to influence what has gone on in past history if we think of some of the bad things that have happened in history. But uh, that might be another way of doing it. Those are the possibilities. And if you're going uh, into time traveling, you have to think, well, uh, what time would I want to go to? What time in mind would I have? And uh, in that case, would I want to see anybody? Any historical character of sorts? And who might it, who might it be? Well, that'd be interesting. So we have that to think about. <laughs> Back in time? Are you coming from the, uh oh, I saw lightning. Are you coming from the future? I hope, hey, maybe somebody here is from the future. We don't know it. Anyway, the point being that I don't think anybody's come up with that. Oh, hey, I uh, don't know if you came across uh, uh, the uh, idea of people coming to us from the future. A guy, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Titor or something of that nature is supposed to be uh, a time traveler from the future to us. Uh, and he claims he can tell us what happened in the future. 
Now, I don't know how far in the future, but he can say anything, and we won't know anyway, because maybe he can talk about the future well beyond our lifetime. But uh, I'm sure he can't predict uh, the lottery numbers and things of that nature, so he's not important to us right now. And so in the meantime, we can think about what we would do before we travel to the future. I mentioned what time in the future, how long we want to stay there. How do we get back? Well, do we want to come back? Too many uh, creditors chasing after us. Maybe we don't want to come back. We owe too many bills, whatever the case might be. But uh, you would be in a different place in time completely. Wow, that would be kind of a strange occurrence, and I'm sure you want to return back to the present time. Now, how is that done? Bring us back to the present time, exactly. You might wind up back in time to a different point, not the present. So there's all kinds of problems with time travel if you do it physically. But if you're just looking at it as not a participant, but as a viewer, ah, now there's a chance. So maybe that's the way to go. I don't know. I'm not sure which way to go at this point. Although it may be... Uh, uh, there are ways to go to the past as a participant, physically, and yet not affect the causal relationships, the history that went on, that has taken place. And one way of doing it, which I'll get to in a series if we can start any time, maybe I'll get ahead a little bit. Uh, one way of moving back to the past time travel to the past, is not by altering it, but it's believed that, and this is strange, this is strange, it's believed in the idea of parallel universes or parallel timelines, which they think some theoretical physicists think might be a possibility. If that's possible, parallel timelines and every time we make a decision to do something, it creates a new timeline, or maybe several of them, all based on the idea of the quantum theory and probability. So there's the probability of creating many universes by making a decision. It creates, it opens up all those possibilities. And if that's the case, and we're talking about time travel, and we go back physically in time, we can avoid influencing what goes on in history by moving to a different timeline, a different parallel universe, alternate reality, whatever you want to call it. So this is one way of not having the problem of affecting history by going back in time. We can eliminate that problem by moving to a parallel universe. Now again, hopefully we can return from where we go. I mean, this is the biggest problem, returning back again. Uh, you got it? Okay. Let me get back over here. Expecting things to go out. So we'll be continuing on with the presentation. So the idea is, if you can't enter a parallel universe and you go back in time, then you're stuck with some kind of problems. And one of them is called the grandfather problem. And that's the idea, moving back in time as being a problem. The paradox, here it is. If you move back in time and you purposely, I don't know why you would want to do this, but you purposely, or maybe just by chance, by mistake, murder your grandfather, we have a problem. Then you don't have a father and you don't exist. That's the grandfather paradox going back in time. Oh, got him. No, that can't be done. You have to avoid doing that. And this applies also to the idea of uh, uh, the movie. Again, the idea of going back in time in that movie. We have the idea of Marty 
and the Dr. Brown. So if Marty moves into the, as you see this kind of a circular sort of thing, when Marty moves back in time and uh, he messes up the chance of his father marrying his mother back in time, then he has a problem. They don't get married. He doesn't come to life. He doesn't exist. And it starts all over again. A loop is created as well. So that's the problem with the grandfather paradox itself. And there are uh, other paradoxes as well that can be created. But that's the major one. The idea of uh, that uh, grandfather paradox. I mentioned parallel universes just before, and here is a notion of parallel universes, where if you go back in time uh, and you make a decision and parallel universes occur, if you can find out how to gain access to the parallel universes that might be formed based on the theory of parallel universes, alternate timelines, and so forth, then if you can figure that out, you can move along a different timeline and, as I mentioned, bypass the notion of affecting history in that sense. So here's a diagram showing the notion of different universes branching off from the present one when a decision is made. And one example given is, uh, say for an example, you have a cat that's, uh, say, asleep and awake. Well, if you make a decision and it follows the path of the one that's asleep, then nothing happens. But if you make a decision and you follow the lower path, then it goes on to developing those other alternative or parallel universes. So it seems as branching off of uh, the universe we're in. And we might be a branch that branched off a previous one as a result of that whole kind of idea of parallel or alternate universes. Now, in order to also have time travel, here's the other theory involving the use of strings to move back in time, backward in time. And it was developed by a guy from Princeton, I think he's retired now, Richard Gott, and came up with the idea of cosmic strings to move backward in time. It's believed that the cosmic strings are left over. It's a theoretical kind of structure about the size of uh, the width of an atom, very small, but extensively long. And it's believed that these, these uh, cracks in the fabric of space-time called cosmic strings, whatever you want to call them, exist presently. And he was saying that if they came together or they, they passed, if you had two strings that were parallel to each other, moving in opposite directions, as they passed by each other, they would uh, create a loop in the space-time fabric, and that loop then would serve as a curvature in space-time, creating that kind of curved time loop. That's what its cosmic strings have to do with. But there's no evidence presently of there being cosmic strings other than a kind of theoretical sort of structure that existed after the Big Bang. And it's just parts, they believe, of our universe, or maybe others, that were completed with some kind of fault in it, some kind of defect in it. And those cosmic strings may be th an example of those defects. Well, in any case, here's Gott, and his notion is parallel strings moving in opposite directions, causing a curvature in time. And that's the idea. Now. There's uh, also an extension of his idea into hyperspace, superstring, where in that theory it's believed that right in our own dimension of time space right now, there are other dimensions coiled up, so very small that they're not noticeable to us in our frame of reference in terms of what we can perceive here right now in our existence. And so these things exist, theoretically, all wrapped up into loops, hidden within the framework of our own time and space, in our own three dimension, four dimension, including time. So there are these hidden dimensions in this hyperstring theory that are involved in that theory. 
So there's all kinds of wild ideas about that. And again, the problems involve the notion that uh, we just don't have the information at the present time and technology to create things like that, to test it. Well, first you have to test it. That's why I mentioned before, I talked to that, that professor at the University of Buffalo who was testing for the presence of a wormhole, a wormhole, maybe more, in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. The first thing is to develop a test to test for the existence of things like that, including cosmic strings or whatever else can be used as a kind of a device for time travel. And uh, we don't have the present technology to do that. That's one of the major problems. Can create the energy necessary for that to take place. But again, it's supported by solutions to Einstein's equations. They support the probability, I'll say probability, of these things existing. And that's why these scientists continue on with trying to find out more information about it. Now, here's someone I spoke to as well. He uh, came to New Jersey, the Jersey City uh, University. At that time, when I saw him, though, it was Jersey City State College. <laughs> now it's a university, like maybe all the different colleges are becoming. And uh, his name is Ronald Mallet. Now, he had an idea of creating a time machine. His idea is still there, by the way. I'll go into it uh, a little more uh, further on. But uh, his idea was to go back in time when he was a kid, go back in time because his father died when he was rather young. And he wanted to go back in time because he, he really uh, loved his father that much. And so what he did is, I, I guess it served as an attraction, a carrot, so to speak, to lead him on to find out more information about how maybe this can be done. So as a kid, he went into reading all kinds of books and things of that nature. Uh, he went into reading Einstein's ideas about time travel and whatever else, and his theories of general and special relativity, and finally got into college and uh, got his degree and became a theoretical physicist all on the basis of wanting to go back in time. And so he came up with the notion of a possibility of time travel. And he did this by thinking of using the frame dragging technique, having something that would frame drag space time to loop upon itself to create a passageway back in time to go back to the past, which again, is possible based on Einstein's equations. So what he came up with is the idea of a uh, circulating laser cylinder. Circulating laser cylinder. He said that uh, 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 the previous ideas of frame dragging mostly had to do with larger masses. But he said, well, maybe rather than use a mass, we can use energy since energy and mass should be equivalent, E equals mc squared in terms of Einstein's idea, uh, his equation. And so Dr. Malley came up with the notion of circulating a laser, a strong laser, which would frame drag space-time, looping it upon itself, creating a passageway back in time. He still has the idea. He tried to get money for it. A movie might be made about his life and what his attempts are, but that's where he is right now. Now, he reached the point where he's, he's retired now as well, but he's still working on the project as much as he can. And then he open up the doorway, so to speak, for other people to follow to see if that can be done. So he opens up the possibility. It's got to work step by step, obviously. You can't just jump into it and all of a sudden come up with a way to time travel. And it's being done now, as you can see and understand. So this is the idea of moving back in time. And uh, so the paradox can be done by parallel universes. That parallel of the grandfather being killed. And therefore, the person killing him no longer exists because he happened to be his grandson. So this can be taken care of that way, looking at parallel universes, coming up with the technology hey, Carl? and so forth. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, do you know about how long we have left? Because uh, I just got word that weather is starting to move in rapidly. Okay, I'm going to move fast. So. I'm going to go through time fast, okay?
Watch me travel. <laughs> Watch me travel. Okay. <laughs> so one way, another way of doing it. Hey, here's another idea. This is the Alcubia warp drive. Imagine Star Trek leads into somebody thinking about it and coming up with the possibility of traveling this way using warp drive. Guy's name is Alcubier, Mexican uh, theoretical physicist. And Alcubier uses warp drive by not going faster than it's the speed of light itself, but thinking nature out, so to speak, and creating a bubble of time space around it that goes faster than the speed of light carrying the vehicle that the traveler is in. So the vehicle and the traveler are not going faster than the speed of light, uh, light not violating Einstein's absolute speed of light barrier, but using time and space itself to do that. And he does it by using exotic matter. That's why exotic matter is necessary now. NASA's come up with it. We're on our way. And the idea being to compress time and space in front of that vehicle and expand it behind. That's how it's done, like riding over a wave. That's his idea. So, you like to travel? Meet me Friday. <laughs> Last Friday. That's the idea. That's the whole presentation. Oh, by the way, we have time. One fast one. I have a poem that I picked up from somewhere. Quite interesting. There was a lady from Bright who was able to travel faster than light. She started one day in a relative way and returned on the previous night. All right. So we do have a question answer session. Uh, I am going to go over a couple things because I noticed a couple of you uh, got back in. But first, I'm going to switch mics so that I have the slightly better mic for walking around. So just one minute. Hey. We're just going to set this one down. Hey, back to my hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> hold this. I am just going to clip this right there. All right. Can you try talking? See if that gets you. I'm tr I'm trying to talk. Can you hear me? Good. I'll stop talking then. <laughs> All right. So. Hello. 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 You can talk to my my best mic. Okay. So, a uh, couple things for the people who came in during the middle of the uh, presentation. Um, face coverings are optional, uh, but. I'm using it because I like having healthy, happy coworkers. I don't know about you. Uh, it makes them slightly less cranky. Uh, if you want to wear one, you can. If you don't, you don't have to. Um, we are following the guidance of the CDC and whatnot. Uh, so we are a nonprofit. So any donations and whatnot you or sales through the gift shop. Do go to keeping our lights on, keeping our our public programs available and free. Uh, do check us out on our website, uacnj.org, and our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Discord. So all of those ways uh, you can get a hold of us. You can have great conversations with our uh, people. Uh, if I'm you leaving. <laughs> uh, I'm here right home. You can't leave just oh, yet. Oh, I gotta stay. I you are a prisoner. I have no money for Uber. I have no money for Uber. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll get you home safe. So, uh, when you do go to leave, please use your headlights. We do not like uh, people getting hurt and run over. If you need to use the restroom, we have the porta potty right over to my right, your left. The gift shops to my left. Usually, we would have our uh, telescopes open over there. Unfortunately, weather is coming in, so I think we have them closed up right now. So, yes, they are all closed. I was just informed. So, on with the question and answer session. How is it going to work? I am going to take this microphone and bring it over to you for your question. But we also have questions online. So, let's start this off with an online question. So, the first one is from online. 
Uh, are you stating that the Bose and Eisen construct? What was Einstein? Bone, the con constitution, what was it? Condensate. Condensate. Exotic matter. That's the easy the, way of saying it. I'm like, I know there's a C word there and I can't remember it. Uh, <laughs> will be able to protect us from being torn apart in a wormhole. Will that be able to protect us from the wormhole? Yeah, because the wormhole has a tendency to collapse due to gravity. And this will, uh, since it's anti-gravity, it'll hold it open. All right. Was there any questions from you guys? Oh, I got one. Let me walk out there. But um, my first one was probably... Oh, great. Now I think about how I can... But, um... Oh, yeah, one thing I heard was that if you actually went at light speed, time would seem to stop. So I thought of, like, a problem with that, if you even could do that. Wait, I, I missed where you're having a problem with. Um, if you... If I you can't hear you. If you go faster than... I mean, like, the speed of light in a, in a rocket or whatever... Yeah. It wouldn't that mean you couldn't perceive time and you wouldn't be able to stop and you would just go straight to the end of time. <laughs> so basically he's saying when you are going faster than light, time seems to stop because you yeah. are going faster yeah. than you can perceive time. How would that make stopping a problem? No, then time would go backwards. That's the <laughs> I will be with you guys in a Yeah, right, right. Okay? It's believe that time goes backward. That's another kind of paradox. When you go faster than it's which is why you can't go faster than the speed of light. So you fake it out by creating a bubble around yourself of space time and you have the bubble move through so it goes faster than the speed of light and you're not affected by the speed of light causing you to go backward or make you disappear, whatever the case might be. By creating that bubble moving that air warp drive is a thing that would solve that problem all right so we have another question from online and it says um do you believe that the branches of timelines or parallel universes are they different timelines or do you believe they are it, the same thing in theory uh do you believe they are completely separate entities after they have branched or that they They're remain different the entities. same thing? Then, then you're perceiving yourself as yourself, but you're really a different entity in a parallel universe. All right. Was there any more questions from our in-person audience? You might have to raise your hand, wave it out about a bit because I'm kind of hard to see in the dark without my distance glasses. You. By the way, there is an inter if anyone's listening, there is an interesting kind of thing I didn't mention involving our consciousness doesn't perceive necessarily what we call reality because our brain has evolved in the context of our time frame here in our existence on Earth to have us be able to make sense out of things and survive. That's the only thing that it has evolved to accomplish. Survival. And so our consciousness now in terms of what in reality we have as consciousness is, is being questioned and investigated. That's a whole new area of investigation by the theoretical physicists consciousness as well as the people in psychology uh right so it is starting to rain so unfortunately we got to get uh the uh, sensitive electronics inside so i think we will wrap it up for tonight <laughs> oh we just have one last minute question hold on uh, it's about that ergosphere which i said ergosphere yeah around I the black a, hole i saw a video on that and one thing they said was that to stand still, you would basically have to go like faster than light, which is impossible than like the opposite way. But wouldn't that mean that the bla that the ergosphere would push you at the speed of light? Or well, you know, there's different kinds of ideas about what's necessary in order to survive going to the black hole. 
uh, to the ergosphere, uh, uh, missing the singularity. You want to get away from that singularity. And when you do that, there's many ideas about whether you survive or not. And you probably saw one idea about not being able to survive. And there are other scientists that believe you can. So it depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> That might be a oh, possibility. Right. Yeah. So, the, everyone, thank you for uh, coming to our in person presentation. Thank you for watching online. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, weather is moving in rather rapidly. Yeah, so I we will be ending tonight. Thing. Any additional questions, please add it into the comments on the YouTube channel. I will look at those and get back to you as soon as I can. So, have a, with that, have a good night, guys.